Welcome to A Photographer's Life. The channel that takes you behind the curtain into the world of professional architectural photography. Join us now for an episode with some of America's premier architectural photographers. Today's broadcast comes from a recent Zoom meeting of the Association of Independent Architectural Photographers. This discussion is led by AIAP Director Alan Blakely. We hope you enjoy the show. If you do, please let us know by liking this episode and subscribing to this channel. Now, on with the show. Let's let's kind of jump into this. I don't have a you know, any kind of a scripted outline for this, and my voice is not going to last very long. I had uh, neck surgery four weeks ago, and um, my voice won't last very long. So um, I I hope that you'll feel free to to you know kind of lead this and uh, let me know where this needs to go. Um, is everyone here? There's not anybody shooting film anymore, is there? <laughs> I know the last time I, I brought this up, there was one guy shooting film, and he felt very offended that I made the assumption that that uh, we were all digital. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go get mine. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first film camera I just bought this on uh, off a guy on Facebook for a hundred bucks. It is the first time in 15 years that I have thought about shooting film because this, this is the OM-1, the original. Yeah. And uh, this was the first decent camera I ever used and ever owned. So, uh, Me too. <laughs> but I, I don't think I'll be taking it on to uh, a location anytime soon. No. Yeah, I I had an, an OM-1 as well. Actually, I had a couple of them and uh, they thoroughly disintegrated. But uh they were, <laughs> they were a good camera well, to learn on. Um, well, this one, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I still, I still enjoy shooting film for personal work. I, yeah, my, I think that's not uncommon. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, one of the things in, in schools, they still teach film quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, partly like that's even increasing. Yeah. I think it is increasing. It's partly because kids want it. Um, uh, but but the 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 other side of that is that fine art and wedding photographers shoot a lot of film, but um, it's also because a lot of the people that teach are not working professionals in a commercial or editorial sense. So okay. they're they come out of a fine art background, and I mean I talk about this when I teach professional practices. I tell my students I kind of pull back the curtain and I say a lot of the people that teach have master's degrees because they knew they'd never make a living as a fine art photographer and uh, well, writers, poets, painters, they all do this, you know, or it's a give back. So, <laughs> you're, you're you know, so tactful. <laughs> yeah. So there's no shame in it, but there's a, that means that the, uh, the, the educational past, uh, the technical stuff is th there's going to be a lack that that would be valuable once they graduate if they, if they, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, um, just as far as workflow goes, um, I'm making the assumption that most of everybody's using Lightroom and Photoshop and, and going that route. Um, uh, capture one. Yes. Okay. Um, use capture one to capture one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As far as your capture software, um, I've never used Lightroom for a capture software, uh, but I understand a lot of people do. So um, yeah, up until just a couple of days ago, um, I never even fired up Lightroom. I, I never use it. Oh, okay. Do all, the, do all the folks using Capture One, you tether everything to a laptop? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I used to. Not anymore. Um, now I use Cam Ranger. Yeah. So I use Cam Ranger 2 and I shoot that to either uh, shoot to the SD card and I use the, all the live previews and the previews to either uh, I usually shoot from my phone and I give the client the iPad and set the iPad up for client mode so that they just get the images pop in mm -hmm. and then they can wander around, grab coffee, whatever they want to do. Um, and uh, I, I don't do any editing at all on set, none at all. Um, no, neither, but... I, yeah, I just bracket everything and uh, just let them pick what they want from that. I find that Cam Ranger has been just as solid as it can be. That's what I do too, and I I shoot an iPad that's on a 
uh, tripod so that uh, people can stand around and review it if they have to. And uh, it, it really almost never fails. It's made my life so much easier. Like yeah. the amount of times I've kicked laptops off of stands and, you know, put <laughs> cables around tripods yeah. trying to move stuff about. Uh, it just frees everything up so much. And I, I just bought one of those giant gifts as well um, with, a, I don't know how big it is, like 13 or 15 feet. So you can just shoot the thing up over all the traffic or whatever wow. if you're in the street and, you know, just fire it off from the top of there so that the live preview is great. Wow. Do you ever, so I, I do the same. I shoot a camera and dry. I like very few projects do I lug around like a laptop on a stand anymore. Mm -hmm. But do you, like, sometimes I do run into clients who have a difficult time visualizing what we're going to end up with, right? If something in a, you know, if the dynamic range is too extreme and you, right. the image does really have a long way to go. Sometimes clients sort of struggle, you know, clients that have worked with me kind of are just like, yeah, we know it's going to be fine. But first time clients, if they're not used to it, do you guys run into that at all or it's not an issue? Mm -hmm. I run into it constantly, personally. I, I don't. I don't use any of that at all. I, I don't show anybody anything until I'm done shooting, and then uh, I process it. And I mean, I I don't show anything on set. What if there's like an art director or a stylist? They can look for, through the viewfinder of the camera if they want to see the composition, but I don't do anything. <laughs> I, I I really don't. I don't show them anything. Um, I think that is one of the advantages of Cam Ranger, though, is that they can see that live view. And make adjustments. Um, uh, yeah, I couldn't live without the live view. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it's been such a lifesaver for me because um, my wife works as the stylist usually, and so she could be walking through the set and looking at things. And, and well, that's the thing that I found as well, especially when you're using things like the 17 mil TSE. Yeah. It's so wide, and it and it has its own inherent distortion that what they see from standing behind you behind the tripod can sometimes look absolutely nothing like what the camera's seeing. Oh, yeah. So giving them the iPad and being able to have them physically walk into the shot and move it and see what the camera's going to see is, is great. Well, the other part of the camera ranger too, is that you can email right out of it. I, I had a project where the, the uh, essentially the art director was on the East coast. So I would take a shot, email it to her. Yeah. Um, and she'd say, move that chair four inches to the left. And we just did that for about a half an hour until I got the shot that she wanted. And then she was happy and signed off on it on an email. So I had a written record that she mm -hmm. was happy. Um, I'm a paranoid enough that I love a written record. <laughs> Is there anybody that, that does? I mean, I run into that situation where I, you know, my client's not there a lot. And uh, is anybody live streaming? To, uh, it, as a solution to that i literally will take a picture i just had this the other day there was a couple of questions i had you know i do test shots and scouts and everything but there were a couple i probably should have been more thorough reviewing stuff with the client but yeah. i had some questions i literally was taking photos of my ipad with my phone and texting him and saying do you want the stairs in this shot do you want this wider little things like that um but that's as close as i come to live streaming anything okay yeah, it's like Barry was saying is being able to use the Cam Ranger and just be able to hit share straight from that and send it straight to a, it just opens up your email or your text or whatever it is and just shoot that off to the client. Um, I Yeah, I have a bunch of stuff where I have people in different sides of the country and yeah. they'll just get a text or an email when I'm kind of, oh, you know, I'll, I'll hit them up part way through, say, like, are we in the right direction with this stuff? A lot of my people don't really kind of hold it over me on every shot. Want to sign on off, off of every shot as we go. They just kind of let me do what I do, and I'll just kind of say, uh, it, you know, here's a average exposure of the entire shot. We'll obviously we'll get the lights back, we'll get the windows back, whatever, all that sort of stuff, and yeah, they sign off straight from that. I think especially if you've got a client you've worked with a lot, there's that level of trust where they're not too worried about whether or not you get the shot or not that if they see that cam ranger preview um is it that occurs to me i've been in touch with uh, the developer of cam ranger off and on uh, over the last year or so with some firmware um requests <laughs> is, is there anything about cam ranger that you would that you would change or that you would like to see change i'm just curious 
I've sent them like kind of a laundry list of very little, <laughs> mostly little things, right? Yeah. Um, but it, I, I switched from Nikon to Canon and I found it, it works better with my D850 than it does with my uh, R5. Mm-hmm. I get like, er- does anybody get like, I get like error messages a lot when I'm bracketing. I don't know if anybody gets that if they shoot Canon. Yeah. And, and see, that's where I've been in touch with them. Um, I, I don't know if anybody ever used the Arsenal um, camera assistant. Um, it was kind of like a cam ranger. This is still out there. It doesn't, it's a, it's a pretty sleek little thing, but it, it doesn't give you the variety of uh, options that the cam ranger does. But one of the things it does that I really liked is when I was bracketing is that it, it locked up the mirror and kept it locked up for the bracket sequence, uh, which gave me a noticeable difference in sharpness. And I can't get the cam ranger to do that. And the developer gave me some instructions on how to do it. And I still can't get it to work that way. But to me, that would be huge as if it, it would lock that mirror up and, and keep it locked up for the duration of the sequence, however long that may be. The, the trick is, Alan, you get a camera with no mirror in it. <laughs> <laughs> like a camera. Not really a camera. <laughs> Well, the R5 is, uh, I haven't used it. Uh, I'm trying to justify, I'm desperately looking for a reason to force myself to buy it. I shoot with a 5 DSR, but uh, that R5 sounds like a really superior piece of equipment. I mean, you can make anything work, right? It's not a big deal, but like I had a D850 and I switched to a 5 DSR and I looked at one file and I like threw that thing out the window and got an R5. Like the dynamic range and like, just like you, you can't do anything with a five DSR five, which again, if you're bracketing in your workflow, you may not care and it may not be necessarily like everybody, everybody shoots with a five DSR, but the quality of the files is like night and day as far as like pushing and pulling, which really? may not be relevant to your workflow, but um, it is. I just, the, the best thing about the mirrorless is I just have the adapter that has um, the polarizer in between the lens and the camera. So I don't have to like, mess around with like filter adapters and all that that's been that's to me like the biggest advantage of shooting with the mirrorless and whose adapter is that canon is a canon yep i haven't looked into that camera very much quite honestly um because i'm so used to using the 5 dsr but i can see that it's got some really significant advantages and And filter holders oh sorry go ahead barry well, that, that filter holder is also for like ND filters, right? If you're going to be you shooting. Put anything in there, yeah. Yeah, because that, that camera will shoot decent video as well. That's a, for me, it's a downside because I don't do any video. So you're paying four grand, you know, 2,500 of it is really for the video, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a bit of a waste of money, but um, I'm hoping, you know, when the, like whatever their R5S comes out, um, I'll get rid of the R5 and go to that, but we'll see. What what is the R5s? It's supposed to be like a ninety megapixel camera from Canon. Holy shit! We'll see if Sony, Sony or Can- they've all they've all have. There's all rumors of this. You know, I think Sony will probably be the first to it. Does anybody shoot Sony Canon lenses to Sony bodies? I shoot. I no. I I shoot Sony Sony lenses, Sony bodies. Really? What body? You have no uh, shifting. No, I don't have any problem with it. I mean, I I, I shoot. Um, I've got uh, a seven R two mirrorless, which I don't care for. I don't like the the mirrorless viewfinder. Um, yeah, I don't either. I, and I've and I've got some uh, some old eight nine hundreds that I that I shoot with all the time. Hmm. I use mirror lockup. Um, my favorite lens to use on that camera is a uh, is a Minolta twenty millimeter, and it's phenomenal. It's sharp, tack sharp. And you know, they broke. Don't fix it. That's interesting. They have good dynamic range in that camera as well. It, yeah, it has excellent dynamic range. Yeah. yeah, that's what I've heard. I have an A six thousand five hundred that is my sort of walk around camera, and I've been very impressed with with that. And yeah, there's um the um another photographer that works with me. He's got the seven R four that came out sixty one megapixels. That's a phenomenal camera. I mean, it's the dynamic range in that is is unbelievable. 
I mean, yeah. the ISL range is, it's, I mean, it's incredible. It's, it's tempting, but then again, I just don't care for an electronic viewfinder. And I've never had any application where I've needed more than a new five megapixel file. I mean, I, we, we, we do artwork here all the time and I've never had anybody ask for anything larger than a 20 by 30. So mm-hmm. it's worked out nice with me. This is, this is a, this is a discussion. I can't, I, I'm really going to be listening more than anything because I guarantee I do things a lot harder than all of you. <laughs> I, I really do, you know, because I'm, I'm an old, you know, I, I started in, with a Photoshop. I do everything. I like, I fired it up the other day. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand it. Um, I don't see the bend, I guess. So I'm, I'm going to do a lot of listening today. Well, I use Lightroom. I'm Capture One. Person. Yeah, I'm a, um, I, I don't care for Capture One. Um, I don't like things that show me, slow me down on the, on the shoot. My clients all trust me. If they have a, an, you know, a, a spread they need for Digest or Lux or CS Interiors, they'll tell me what they need, and, and I'll get it for them. But um, I, I haven't. It's probably been three or four years since I've had been on a shoot where I had to tether something, an art director, mm-hmm. and and I don't like that. It's it's uh, it's very restrictive and it's it slows down the creative. I think. But, yeah. Well, That's I will make one pitch for shooting tethering, uh, at least a cam ranger, which is, if nothing else, you can check focus. Yes. Uh, I still can focus by eye, but I don't trust myself. And, you know, uh, if if uh, eight out of 10 shots are in focus, that's great. But those two, those are the ones you're going to need. And so yeah. I, I love being able to do that. Yeah. I manual focus everything. Um, yeah. Shoot with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, let, let's move on from the capture end of things in, into um, where those files start. And uh, I'd like to kind of hear your different production techniques. I, I personally dump everything into Lightroom. Um, and, and then I, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll edit out the things that I'm not going to do from there. But then I will a lot of times batch process my brackets through Aurora, uh, given a preset for that particular job that I've created. Um, and then, then they go back into Lightroom and I do some tweaking again, and then they go into Photoshop for final revisions before I deliver. Can you, where do you, what is Aurora? Is that a plugin or is that a standalone? I'm not familiar with well, it. Well, it works as it, it's both. Um, it has a it has a Lightroom plugin, but it also works as a standalone where you can batch process. Um, it, you have to you have to kind of pull it back a little bit because it tends to really oversaturate and you know give more contrast than you need, and and so you have to uh, not not just let it do its own thing. You, you'll have to set some presets on it. But for me, it gives me, it'll pull more out of the shadows and highlights than the chromatics okay. or light room as far as blending uh, brackets. And so I use that for a lot of things. There are some things though that it just fails terribly on. And I'll either, I'll go into another HDR type program um, and go from there. But for most yeah, things, it works really well for me. Yeah, it's got no a lens distortion correction, which I think is a real downfall for that software. I I I have it. I use it once in a while. Um, yeah, for any for any lens distortion, after I've batched it through for through Aurora, then I'll take it back into Lightroom and, yeah. and correct any distortion there because there are some things like you know gradient and radial filters and things like that that I need to use in Lightroom after I've blended those images together. Um, yeah. And I, I do send out uh, stuff when I know it's not something really critical. If it's, say, exteriors or aerials, I'll send those out and have those blended elsewhere um, just to save me the time. Uh, I have three three blending softwares that I use. Uh, the one in Lightroom is the one I use the most called Infuse. Mm-hmm. Uh, which what I think I've talked about that before here. I, I like it because I can take each image, modify it for temperature. I can do uh, dodge and burn. I can change the temperature of the sky. I can do all kinds of things, flam them. Down. And in challenging environments, um, can get a pretty decent photo. But when that 
work, I either use the HDR inside uh, Lightroom, which is okay, um, and then um, picks, pick, uh, oh, for Christ's sake, uh, I'm going to look it up right now and tell you, but, you know, it's the old, the original on Pixel something or another here. Um, and between those three, I get a decent result of, you know, doing exteriors or, or even interiors with big windows. If there's plants moving around, it'll take care of the ghosting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's always very really nice. Yeah. Um, I also use the ghosting options on there um, because I like, like all of you, I've got architects and designers who like to see blurry figures in the shot. <laughs> so uh, I, I will use that. I don't pay too much attention to how blurry they are on the capture necessarily within reason. I try, you know, I, I know what's going to work and what isn't, but, but then I can fine tune that amount of blur with those figures uh, in mm. like Aurora or uh, whatever. Um, Photomatics, by the way, is the one I was, yeah. the name I was trying to remember. Photomatics. Yeah. Yeah. It's a be much better program than it. And there are some things that for me, I have to, I go back to Photomatics because it's the only one that works in some unique situations for me, yeah. uh, especially if I'm in an industrial situation with really odd lights. Uh, it tends to figure that out better than the other programs. Um, Easy mm -hmm. HDR is another one that uh, has some unique. That's my effect. favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Easy HDR is my favorite. It, to me, um, if you're doing a blend, Looks more like a photograph when you're done than mm -hmm. in photomatics. I can yeah, always I, I can, it does I can look at any picture and say if it was done with photomatics, like it's got <laughs> a character to it. And um, Aurora less so, but easy HDR is is to me is the the truest thing. If you're not working straight and raw, that's a good program. Yeah. Is anybody um, sending everything out here? I mean, is there anybody that's not mm -hmm. doing? Yeah. I do everything in house. Okay. Yeah, I I do my own post. Well, when I unless I run into a situation where it's more complicated than uh, know how to do. Yeah. I never really got good at the marching ants uh, as as good as I should. Uh, it's an it's an erotic. I I, I admit it. Uh, but um, but no, I do ninety nine percent of everything myself. Yeah. Mostly, what I send out is is when I have either objects that need to be removed or objects that need to be added, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. I'm not good at that. And I'm not going to burn up a half a day doing something that, you know, some nice little lady in India can do in five minutes. <laughs> so what is the, uh, I'm always uh, trying to have something in my back pocket about people like that, that do, uh, you know, clipping services and stuff. Which, which one do you use that you like? Um, I use pro image experts. Um, pro very, image, yeah, pro image experts. They're very reliable. And the other one I use is uh, Image Solutions India. And uh, between the two of them, I can usually get most things done. Pro image experts will does an overall better job. They're a little more expensive. Uh, image Solutions India will do um, as far as custom retouch. Uh, they do some really nice stuff where I need something, you know, just really complicated retouch, little things removed and changed and moved and stuff I would not even want to attempt. And they get it back to me overnight. So between the two of those, but I've used at least a dozen others with terrible results. So <laughs> those, are the, those are the two. I mean, and I just, I just sent one of my clients to um, pro experts and they had a, a really complicated job that was um, stainless steel kitchens and which is just a nightmare and I did the best I could to minimize reflections and, and lasers and all you know, kinds of things on the stainless and it still wasn't right and so they sent it over there and it came back perfect and I think the, they had like I don't know, 40 images. I think they pay $200. <laughs> wow. Wow. So. That's the best on that. <laughs> <laughs> free. 
Can I ask a question here? Brian Dressler from South Hi, Carolina. Brian. How's how's everyone? I, I've been in and out of the camera because I'm meeting some deadlines and having to trim some prints and stuff. So I want oh. to say hello to everybody and thank you for this great uh, group of people to share op openly share. Um, let me ask you, Alan, um, do you use pro image experts for blending images or for clipping paths or both or for everything or what? Uh, for both. Um, okay. And what was the other one that's in India? You said something solutions? Image solutions, India. Yeah. Image solutions, India. Okay. And they, uh, their forte is what? I think custom retouch is probably what they do best. Okay. Um, just the general blending. I tend to um, prefer the pro image experts because they, they get it right quick, more quickly. Um, they tend to be able to have better eyes on things. But as far as doing detail work, the Image Solutions India is pretty amazing. I've had to do some stuff that uh, I wasn't really sure was even possible. And it just, you know, it comes back overnight and it's perfect. And so anyway. Yeah, the do the do overs are a real hang up when oh, it's not when it's not right, even though it's uh, overnight service. But I did want to ask: um, Are you always having to send them TIFF files, and they return a JPEG, or will they return a TIFF that's layered, or what? I send them raw files. Um, okay. To both? Raw brackets, um, um, unless it's a finished image that needs to be retouched, but. For blending, I always send just raw files and they return TIFFs. Okay. And then the other one that does the custom retouch, I send them a TIFF and they return a TIFF. And, and they will return it as a layered TIFF if I ask them to. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that. That's sorry for interrupting. <laughs> so so how, do you, how do you do that, Alan? Does that go through Dropbox or something? I mean, when you're sending something that big, how do you? I, I use WeTransfer. Um, you use what? We we transfer is the we transfer yeah it's we transfer dot com <clears throat> that's a service I've used for quite a few years. Um, I do have some clients that uh, their network security doesn't like we transfer, and I have to use Dropbox when I deliver uh, finished files. Uh, but uh, for most everything, that's what I use, and I think you can send up to twenty gigs per transfer. So. It's it works out pretty well for me. I upgraded to the pro one for like twelve bucks a month, and you send like two hundred gigabytes in one file drop. So if you've oh. got like a whole ton of uh, processed eight bit tips that you need to send out, and um, yeah, that will do the job pretty easy. What was the name of that service again? That's the WeTransfer, but it's the WeTransfer Pro. Pro, yeah, that's the one I have too. Is the WeTransfer? Yeah, it's like ten or twelve bucks a month, and you yeah, can send it's ridiculous. Up like two hundred gig now. Okay. Yeah, I I do the annual plan, which gives you a huge discount, and uh, I've been very happy with them. They're very fast and very reliable, and the nice thing is is, is that it allows you to um, to give a, an expiration date for each transfer, which is uh, which is really nice. And then you can also go in and forward transfer links, you know, the download links to multiple parties after the fact. So yeah, it's a pretty good track on who's downloaded what updates right, you yeah. and tells you when they've hit the transfer button. And the thing I like about the pro version as well is that you can personalize it so as it actually comes up with your own domain name. Mm -hmm. it you can add all your own uh, backgrounds and wallpaper and stuff and personalize it. So it looks more like it's your own professional FTP instead of just being like a free Dropbox account or something. Or no. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, the wallpaper to me is a, is really a nice feature because I, I change those out every month, those wallpapers. And it gives, I think it's five or six different wallpapers that rotate through as a person's downloading. So they, you know, they get a look at what, what work you've been doing recently, which is really nice. Um, I was curious to know about plugins and um, what everyone's using as far as Lightroom plugins and Photoshop plugins. Um, is there anything that's kind of a go-to that you use all the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I only use plugins in Photoshop. My, my process is basically I just shoot raw, 
bring the rules back, process whatever I want through Capture One. And uh, instead of using heavy HDR, I tend to bracket and then blend the brackets. Um, and I use um, Lumenzia okay. for, my, for my blending, which is a luminosity mask. Um, and that gets back all of my lights. And I can use brackets to, to kind of blend it so you don't get any of those halos or mm -hmm. weird well, marks that you tend to get. Um, Benjamin, what was that plugin you use? A Lumenzia. One thing nice about that, it tends to take care of all those weird chromatic aberrations that you get, uh, you know, on on. Yeah, the thing, the thing that I like about it is that if you get like a good average exposure, you don't need to take a whole ton of exposures to get the bracket. You can just use Capture One to use that one shot, process out in a number of different exposures, and then blend those together instead of blending different shots where, like you said earlier, you may get ghost in from trees or leaves mm. but then like little dark rings when you start to brush in what's going in there so using the one shot i find works quite well sometimes if the situation allows it um but the only other ones that i use uh what's it called uh topaz topaz labs yeah. i use denoise which is really good noise reduction doesn't overcook it and smooth everything out so as it looks crappy and plastic um and uh because you can add a little bit of structure back into the file again once it's taken all the noise out um and the other one is uh their topaz labs sharpening um i find that's that's pretty good i used to just use um an un uh what's it called a high pass filter in photoshop mm -hmm. Um, but I find that Topaz Labs one does just as good a job and it's less effort. And... I, I'm curious why you have noise in your shot. What, what are you shooting at? Uh, I generally always shoot 100 ISO. So if I'm shooting longer. I've got a 5 DSR. So I find that anything over about four or five seconds, you get a little bit, a little bit more noise. And so when I use like a one shot, um, yeah, to to avoid like the ghosts and stuff, when you push that up, then you'll start yeah. gain in the file. Also, I I have to say that if, on because that's my camera. Also, if I really am pushing it um, on my brackets, I will get noise because I'll just I'll just beat the shit out of the images. But no, knowing that I can get rid of the noise later easily allows me to I. I well, I tell myself anyway it, to put more time in on the front and then just remove the noise and boom, it's just gone. Yeah. Benjamin, I, you, don't, you don't like the uh, Capture One noise reduction? I found that pretty uh, good. No, I've used Capture One now since it was like version seven. I think it's on like 14 now. I actually used to work for, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Calumet, the camera company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I used to work. I was there, one of their digital managers for London and the Southeast back when I lived in the UK. Um, and back before I gave all that a miss, uh, I used to do a lot of the Capture One training with Phase One. And I've always told them that I thought that their noise reduction isn't great because it just hammers the hell out the file and it, it softens it up too much for me. Mm. Um, I'm in version 21 and it's doing a pretty good job. Yeah, it'll it'll do it. Uh, I, I find that it doesn't work well. The reason I got the Topaz one and, and then switched out to it solely was because uh, I have a Mavic 2 Pro, um, and that drone has got horrible noise on anything once the sun starts to set. So yeah. any kind of like twilight shot or anything like that, if I want to use it, I have to like hammer the shot. And it and it was at one point when. Um, I think uh, Capture One wasn't reading DNGs properly, so I got into this third-party one, Topaz, and it's it's good. It does the job, you know. It's it's got um, got a little bit more structure building back to it than I find the Capture One does, and I think you can get a free trial. Um, I find that Black Friday tends to be a good time of year to pick up your software because I've got yeah. like stupid good deals on uh, Topaz uh, stuff. Lumenzia as well, um, and other bits and pieces, you know, like get good markdowns on stuff around that time of year. So a couple of weeks, we see all that stuff. It's yeah, super. actually, we have a 25% discount with, with Topaz software through AIP. 
Uh, oh, this, the right. discount code is AIAP25. Uh -huh. and, uh, we negotiated that last year. Um, and yeah, that's that's a great deal. I use I use the denoise and the sharpen. I batch process everything through those two. Everything that I send out goes through denoise and sharpen. Um, uh, JPEG Mini is a good one if you guys need to like batch stuff out for clients. Mm -hmm. I to deliver tips like eight bit tips flattened, high res JPEG and low res JPEG. So then I pretty much like cover all their bases and they like that because then they can just go straight to print library or web and uh jpeg mini is a good one for like batch dropping all of your higher res jpegs you can set like the longest edge to whatever you want pixel count set up a folder to drop them all in you literally just drag and drop and it it squeezes the hell out of the files without any loss of quality I mean, there's obviously some somewhere. And I think basically what it's doing is like, it's almost like it's saving into uh, an 11 quality in Photoshop when you go to a JPEG option. But it, you'd be surprised how much it actually knocks out the file. I'll regularly have like a folder of at the 5 DSR JPEGs so are usually up sort of 40 to 50 megs each. When you drop them into uh, JPEG Mini at like 2000 pixels on the longest edge, which is fine for most web pages, it'll knock them down to about 800 kilobytes from a 40 to 50 meg uh, JPEG. And the quality is still great. Well, you know, you I, I do that, but I don't, I use Lightroom for that, but I uh, send it out at about 50%. Um, I was, this is what I was taught a long time ago by Peter Krogh. I don't know if those of you might be familiar with Peter Krogh, but he's, he, he literally wrote the damn book, the digital asset management book. So he's, He's a reliable source, and he said, you know, for the web, 50%, you're just not going to be able to tell the difference, uh, anything higher, and it does make it smaller. But I wanted to add something else that I don't know if you can do this in JPEG Mini, but in Lightroom, I have a preset for export so that when I send out one for the web and I send out one for printing, it appends at the end dash print or dash web, and I stick those in a folder that say web or print and i've done it <laughs> entirely because i just got tired of uh, clients complaining to me and i said oh, i'm going to make it really easy for them all they got to do is look at the file name and they'll see where it belongs and it's just cut down any problems uh in, in that regard i do the same i've always done that in lightroom is i send a web and a print jpeg yeah i just have two presets it's, it's just, really easy it takes four seconds yeah yeah, and you can do it now. There's uh, anyway, everything's getting better. Doesn't really, you know, every software is better than it was last year. Not Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a problem with with, with CS twenty with the, with the Photoshop shutting down all the time? I, I uh, no. yeah, I, we have it. I mean, I, I have the to me the most bulletproof so Photoshop is CS six suite, and I have it on my Power Max. But on, wow. on any of my on my iMacs, um, we've got the the 2022 and the 2021 version. It's it's atrocious. They 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 lock up all the time. Do you do you use an external uh, uh, drive for the? Yeah, everything's uh, fed from a RAID. No, I mean for uh, the uh, for the uh, oh gosh, what are they? I'm are you sorry. editing off of your RAID? Yeah, for the uh, scratch okay. drive. Do you have a scratch? external scratch drive yeah that... external scratch yeah all right yeah, well, like, I can't state, like i work everything off of a solid state drive and then my backup goes to a raid i wouldn't be working off that raid that's like crawl you're crawling along there yeah. yeah yeah i mean i just updated to the new m1 mac mini um, oh nice i got i got three mac pros set here uh, they're all like topped out with like 80 gigs and even at a m um MBME drives in there, all sorts. And I just got this Mac Mini for probably a third of what I've blown in, like just like average upgrades in RAM on each of these Mac Pro. <laughs> it absolutely flies. Um, yeah, I've heard those are really good. Even yeah. with you, and it's only got 16 gigs of RAM in there. Um, but the way that the That's product, not very much. Yeah, uh, not at all. I mean, like I said, all my Mac Pros had like a minimum of like, 80 to 96 gigs of RAM in there. Um, and 
it absolutely flies through everything. Um, like even like uh, filters like surface blur and stuff like that, um, where it's like real GPU heavy, mm-hmm. it just absolutely creams it. Um, like processing time is cut way down now. Video people uh, love the M1 also. I mean, they have these gigantic files they have to plow through, and they've they've really found the M1 to be very helpful. So, as a consensus, gentlemen, I mean, you think my my Photoshop problem is because I'm serving from a RAID? I'm yeah, working and processing from a RAID. Um, yeah, uh, with this, um, I've never had a problem, you know, up until until Photoshop 2021, and yeah, now 2022 is just bad. solid. And then every time it went into this cloud thing. I, I I was actually in discussion with a couple of the engineers at Photoshop for the longest time because it would just fall over all the time. And I thought it was down to the size of my files because by the time I get through a few layers, right. masks, all the rest of that stuff, some of my files before I flattened them because I'm having to process them out in 16-bit instead of 8 for the, uh, the luminosity masks to be properly effective. Um, like some of them before they were flattened down back down to eight bit again at the end were you know, like two, two and a half, three gigs in size for one image. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just beach ball in and then it would crash. And of course, you know, even if you have your recovery set to five minutes, you're guaranteed to lose, you know. Yeah, five, especially. Yeah. It, it was, yeah I, I've, I've gone back to working primarily on CS6 on my Power Mac because the 2022 Photoshop is just... You've, it's probably, you've probably got something else going on there. Like if I w- Sometimes if like I have to go back to an image, I'll edit it off my RAID. It's just annoying because it's slow. It won't cause like crashing or anything like that. So I bet you've got something else weird cooking there. Yeah, I don't know. It's on. It's on more than. It's not just on this my particular computer. It's on my partner's computer. I mean, you know, we've got a, uh, and they, she's got the same problem. Her Power Mac runs great. The, the iMac, um, and their new iMacs. The the, uh, they just crash all the time with Photoshop. It's a nightmare. Yeah, that would be unbearable. Yeah. Uh, are you? You got the very latest um, installation on that as far as the Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah, it just I'm updated. just wondering maybe if you just did a reinstall of Photoshop, if that might solve things, if there's some fragments, because I know that there was a couple of previous updates I had some real issues with and um, went back to, a, you know, prior, prior versions. And then this latest update seemed to solve everything, but it was a reinstallation that really solved it for me. Yeah, I'll try. But it seemed to be so uh, memory hungry on things. And, and if I had anything else running, it was... A problem. I've got 128 gigs of RAM on this machine, and yeah. um, okay. it still was having a hard time. So, uh, you know, I, the customer service at Adobe on the rare times that I've called them have actually been pretty helpful. Yeah, yeah. I start sending nasty letters now when it's through filling the comments. <laughs> <laughs> they never call back. You know, it's a, yeah. I take my take my frustration out on some poor tech. Mm. Yeah, but I'll try that. I'll, I'll reinstall it. Maybe that'll work. Don't don't send a nasty letter. Send him a case of beer. See if that helps. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it all flies with honey. Yeah, that's true. Um, we touched on just a little bit about the files that that we send. I mean, Barry mentioned this about what we send to clients and things like that. And just to me, that's been something that's I've had to kind of evolve over the years. I used to, just, you know, I used to send him a tip and. And then they didn't know what to do with that. So then I sent him a TIFF and a JPEG. Um, and then the JPEG was still too big. And so like Barry said, you know, you, you have to kind of educate him about, about file size and things like that. But the problem that I ran into then after, I've, even after I've done that and said that these are web JPEGs, then I, I get a call back saying, this looks terrible. Look how fuzzy this is, you know, and they still don't get it. I don't know what the solution is to that. Um, but I, I know that I have fewer problems if I just send a tip and say, you know, and say, let your yeah, designer I, figure it out. I, I do. I use Dropbox for file delivery and I give a, a media folder with has a high end, uh, you know, uh, high def uh, TIFF file. And then I have a another folder that's uh, just it says web and, and I have um, and, and pretty large JPEGs um, this year. All of this year, I've been sending them at 144 pixels instead of 72 
and uh, usually 25, 60 to 3,000 wide mm. for the uh, JPEG. Because with uh, I've noticed uh, some people were complaining that the 72 pixels, 3,000 wide, weren't sharp on a retina res- display. Depends yeah. on the display they have. Mm. So I, I've upped that to my business partner does web development and you know she does all the ads for clients. And she said that should be, be making them 144. And that's kind of solved that. Mm. So, yeah, I, I got that insight from a designer um, a year or so ago to double the double the width, you know, double the size yeah. pixel count of, of what I was doing because I was sending out email and and dropping images in, and they they weren't sharp. And right. uh, so I I wasn't sending an email if my picture looked like that, and and the solution was just to to the, to double the size of it. Yeah, depends on the display. Yeah. yeah. If you're using a 1920 display, you know, the 72 is fine, but these four and five K displays, they need a higher pixel count. So I, I think it also depends on, you know, so for instance, I my my portfolio is on uh photo folio. Mm-hmm. And uh he gets pissed off if you send uh, he Rob, if he's not pissed off that you get a software warning if it's anything over 900 uh kilobyte. Um and he says, just send me 2,000 pixel wide. You don't need to do anything that bigger. And I'm thinking, I don't understand this. But then I realized software developers, you know, 72 PPI, you know, that's pretty ancient technology right there. So the software developers uh, have figured out how to make that, you know, work on these, uh, you know, retina displays. And so uh, I just kind of do that and, and it seems to be okay. But um you know, it's magic as far as I'm concerned. But uh, but size isn't everything, and so sometimes that smaller file just works fine. You know, it, it, it works out nice on the on the retina display. You know, I mean, I think it, well in terms of the photo folio, they're doing some work on the back end for all the clients. So their their assumption is that people are looking at this. The pictures on any, everything from a 32 inch display to a phone and so it does a pretty good job of m- massaging the file uh, for myself i delivered 2000 pixel wide uh images maybe 1200 1600 tall um 72 ppi srgb always srgb uh, and i haven't had too many complaints and in fact for the full res i just sent them the, the biggest uh, file I can dig out of it, also sRGB 300 uh, PPI. And uh, that seems to work for printing. Uh, you know, every now and then somebody wants a TIFF and I'm happy to send that to them. But even at my editorial clients have been happy with the JPEGs. Everybody using sRGB? Yeah, I, I shoot in Pro RGB and then convert to sRGB when I send it up. Yeah. I've got a number of clients. I think in '98. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, a number of clients who, who want to see the tip in Adobe RGB. Yeah, well, and some in yeah. CMYK. So, uh, well, if they want to work on them, you know, an sRGB file is you can't do much with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the but I mean, damn, why why anybody really needs an sRGB file anymore anyway? Because it used to be the browsers had yeah. their own inherent color space and wouldn't be able to switch but firefox chrome uh safari they all have the ability now to read the metadata in whatever file is uploaded and whatever it's reading to be able to uh correct the color space anyway yeah. so the old say- of having to shift to srgb because it was going to web uh, it it really isn't needed yeah, anymore. Still, let's do everything do everything in adobe 1998 yeah, it's wider. I it's find fine. I, get, it, I like know, it better. Yeah. It it doesn't. It's like you're saying. It's not nearly as bad of an issue as it was. Whatever that was four years ago. Yeah. But for printing files, sRGB just locks it down, so they can't. What they're more likely to uh, see what you wanted them to see. Um, and if they're not going to process the photo, if they're not going to do anything to it, sRGB, even a full res JPEG, that that works fine. Just a I mean, years ago, again, Peter Krogh was given a talk. I think it might have been the first day I met him. And he he had three prints that he laid out on a floor that were like 30-inch prints. So they were pretty substantial. And he said one of these was printed as uh, SRGB, JPEG. One of these is Profoto. And one of these is uh, Adobe 98. Pick, pick the one you think 
you know, see if you can figure it out. Nobody could figure it out. They were virtually identical. Mm. So that was a big lesson to me because in terms of printing, not in terms of the web, um, if it's done correctly, your, your workflow is correct all the way through. You're going to get a good result. Yeah, I used to work with a guy when I first moved over here and I I basically I left all my most of my clients back in the UK and had to start pretty much fresh when I moved to the States. So when I moved over here, I started off kind of kicking around with a guy, helping him out with his business that he started up doing fine art prints. And he would print to uh, like ham, uh, like the Hannah Muller heavy rag mm -hmm. um, and do everything from like fine art architectural prints to wedding prints and stuff. And he would just run a, a rip that would convert everything. He'd just literally drag and drop all any clients that sent images in. We would just drag and drop them into a rip. The rip would sort everything out to yeah. make the best use of the paper, uh, stack everything out. It would do all the color correction, and then they're off and out of the you know large format Epson. Yeah, I, I used that for my. I had that on my Mac G4 you know, ten years ago. I had a, a rip program, and it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, if you had a sixty-inch printer, it, you know you could just load it, and it would use every inch of paper correctly. Yeah. The, the, the paper yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, I I asked. Uh, do you all know who Mac Holbert is? Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm name dropping a lot here. Well, at least name dropping as far as our little <laughs> tiny community. <laughs> Mac Holbert was uh, half of Nash Editions. They helped invent digital printing, and I always like to follow that by saying they're first printers in the Smithsonian. So Mac now has a company with uh, Stanley Smith, who used to run the digital lab at the Getty uh, Museum. So the two pretty experts. And I was I bought a, a Canon printer, a Pro 1000, which made Mac a little unhappy because he's, he's an absent guy. Uh, but And I was having some problems. And I said, what rip are you using? And he said, well, I don't use a rip. He said, I just use the 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 Mac. <laughs> the the Mac dialog for printing. I mean, he obviously is, you know, profiling his printers and his computers and all the rest of it. But uh, he said, yeah, I just use that. He said, just keep it simple. You don't need to get fancy. And I, <laughs> now, mind you, I'm not printing giant jobs where I have to fit all the images on a single uh, piece of paper or anything like that. But that was kind of a moment for me when he told me that. And he's a friend, so he can be straight with me. Um, anyway. Is everybody here making prints? We do a lot of prints. We do a lot of wall art here. Yeah. I haven't made a print for years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a great I can't get, it's a great I can't get clients to ask for them. It drives me crazy. I have to give them to them as a gift. Yeah. <laughs> I love to print. I, I've got one client. I um, She's a designer. I, I She must have 35 pieces of wall art that we've done for her over the years. Wow. I mean, nice. you walk into her office, it's stunning. It's impressive, but. We, uh, yeah, I love printing. It's, you know, I'd, I'd like to do more of it. Yeah. There's nothing more real than a print. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. I wanted to touch on one more thing before we get ready to wrap up here. And that's um, uh, color, color profiling as far as calibration, monitor calibration and those kinds of things. Uh, I'm just curious to know, um, first of all, if you are doing it and, se and secondly, uh, if you're not, why not? But uh, and that, but just what works? What works for you? And I, and uh, how do you handle that in your workflow? Yeah, I use an i1 Spider for for mine, and um, I like the software. I've been using it for you know decade, and it's simple, easy, and it's really accurate. So and I can run my you know you can with the i1 you can uh, calibrate your your printer and you can calibrate your monitor. So it's it's really nice. Yeah, I won. I think it's Calibrate. Calibrate now. They got bought. They did. Yeah, they did. Yeah, but it's the same. That's what I've been using. I, I hate their interface. It's clunky and <laughs> it's I, I once I went can't go wrong. I mean, well, I'm, I met the I met a rep once for them. Is it the basic I, or the advanced? I, <laughs> basic, I, basic, 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 you're done. No, you got to use the advanced if you want any accuracy. But. It's just, it's so shitty. Um, <laughs> and uh, I complained to their rep once and she said, I've had this argument with them for years. You know, the engineers are not thinking about the customers. 
well, fine. But it still does a good job, and you just sort of suck it up. And you know, Barry needs to be our our tech mascot. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, you have no idea how little I know. <laughs> no, but he needs to be the mascot for you know professionalism and tech. Yeah. Well, I can bitch. I can bitch really well. And uh, I, well, you know, because I teach professional practices, I had to learn the basics of, of just how to at least describe what to worry about, you know. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm using the same, uh, you know, profile system and spider. Um, but the problem I run into is none of my clients have, have calibrated monitors. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I will invariably get a call from a new client who doesn't really understand the process and say, well, you know, this doesn't this doesn't look right on my mind on a PC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On yeah. my Dell. And uh, uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting discussion. But um, I've been very happy with that product. Is there anybody using anything other than that that uh, they recommend? That seems to be kind of what the standard is here. I think um, Spider itself has gotten better, but those are the only two, period, as far as I know, um, at least as far as the actual pucks. There's some various bits of software out there, but yeah, it's it's okay. My color management guy likes it. And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very anybody, happy with it. Have anybody I mean, I, noticed how good Macs are right out of the box? Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, right out of the box, those things are, it's amazing. You know, I used the spider, whatever the thing was, like one time on my Mac when I got the thing out of the box and it made like an incredibly minute difference. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't calibrated my monitor since, which I probably should, but I do so much correction in Photoshop. I don't know that it matters that much. I don't know. My biggest concern is is not necessarily color, but density. And so that's that's why I recalibrate as often as I do. Because there seems to be a little drift, no matter um, what you've got, and so, and yeah. I worry about because you always. I mean, we used to call it dot game um, in printing, but um, you worry about that extra density that your client's going to see that isn't intended, and so um, I think profiling on a regular basis helps you avoid that. And I tend to even brighten things up just a little bit more than I probably would normally do. Uh, for people that are going to go straight to the web with the work. So, because there's always some density gain there. It seems to be like 15, 20% density gain on on most uh, situations where you post to the web, like Instagram or something like that. So, well, I think also a lot of uh, uh, screens, um, non professional screens, are just cranked up a little higher. That's yeah. just, you know, and um, I mean, I'm on a a decent screen. I've got a BenQ 27 inch monitor that I work on and it wasn't expensive and it doesn't drift very much, but I'm such a paranoid that if I've got a big job coming up, I'll just take five minutes and yeah. suffer through the software. And, at least software. I, and even if it hasn't changed, <laughs> at least I don't have to worry about whether it's changed or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Um, anything else we is is there something we missed that we we ought to cover before we wrap up here? This has been a great discussion. I sure appreciate everyone's input. Anything? I wanted to mention one thing that just yeah. going back to the beginning about re client reviews. So one of the things that has happened through the pandemic, in particular, was for video production because there's more money involved in it. So they figured out ways earlier than the rest of us, I think. Um, to do virtual production. And there's a thing called an act soon. It's A-C-C-S-O-O-N. And it's a way to send video files wirelessly on a set to uh, four or more iPads or something like that. And I think it also has a, and it's not terribly expensive, hmm. three or 400 bucks. And uh, it's also a way that you can you can send it offline or uh, onto the internet. I think they have a way to, to hook into an internet, even on a phone or something like that for, for remote viewing it. And I, I, I haven't ever used it, but I imagine it works also with still images and um, it's just something to consider. Uh, and I, I had forgotten about it. I wanted to mention it before we ended. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's great. I, I don't have to look. Well, the big dog, by the way, is Teradek. So if you want to know what the standard is, Teradek is it. And that's very expensive. I think and that stuff's all pulling like 
typically it's like SDI and video, but I think for your camera, it's probably pulling like the HDMI. It's more for like external monitoring on sets. I don't oh yes, yeah, totally for that. It's not really for us, but it might be, at least the Axoon might work for us if we were, um, uh, like multiple whatever. Wanting to look at a preview. Yeah. Because yeah. Well, they had to keep people off the set. So they'd have to put them in another room or to be able to send a, you know, which is nice. I think it's nice to have the customer in, in another room. <laughs> <laughs> <In that state. laughs> I need to be alone in this space. Yeah, you know. yeah. I'm an artist. I must. I'm a, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I personally, I'm, I'm seeing a lot fewer clients on jobs than I ever have. And it's been great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. Yeah. They, I wanted they, to mention before we wrap up too that um, the traffic on the directory pages has kind of been blowing up. I hope that that um, is translating into additional business and referrals for you. Um, uh, I'm not sure what happened in the last probably six weeks, but um, the bandwidth is, has increased dramatically on the AIP directory. And so I'm just, I'm, we're seeing just a lot of traffic. Um, I'm hoping that's people that are looking for photographers and not photographers <laughs> looking for photographers. <laughs> Uh, photographers work to steal you mean yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> but alan uh june tang gave me a text and he just wanted me to bring up for a subject for the future yeah could you bring up the topic of hiring assistants and interns such as legals legalities paperwork workers comp etc so that's a really good that. one because that's come up we i mean when we first started talking norman and i that we were talking about assistance and things like that and I think that would be a great one to cover. I, for me, it's been really hard lately to find anybody to work. Um, so yeah, internships are uh, something that I used to do a lot with, and that was great. But I haven't for years. So uh, excellent. I appreciate that. Norman. Um, I, I, to everyone that's participated, thank you. This has been great. We've, uh, I think, had a very profitable uh, discussion here, and I appreciate your input and your willingness to share all of your information. This is kind of a rare thing professionally, and I, I really appreciate this to be valuable to not only those that were here in person, but those that view this online. This will be up, um, probably it's going to be about a week and a half before this hits YouTube. Um, but um, at that point, I will also put some links in there. In the meantime, please email me if you have suggestions for corporate discounts. Um, and also any feedback on a marketplace uh, Facebook page and also about adding your personal videos to our YouTube channel or at least trailers for your videos. And I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, everyone have a nice Thanksgiving. Take care. <laughs> you too. Businesses to everyone. Good to see you all again. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alan. This has been another episode of A Photographer's Life. If you've enjoyed this program, please let us know by liking this episode and subscribing to this channel. A Photographer's Life is brought to you by the Association of Independent Architectural Photographers. This episode is copyrighted, and may not be used in full or in part, without the written permission of the AIAP. Please join us again soon for another inside look at the world of professional architectural photography.